Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I am the Assistant Manager of Visitor Experience here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories of the trolley era and our collection that you can experience from home. We plan to continue these programs regularly. So if you have a show that you'd like to share that fits the museum mission or um, you know, features something about the trolley era or our collection or cities where our trolleys come from, please reach out to me. You can find my email address in the um, uh, confirmation email that you got today. And I can share it in the chat as well. And if you have a program that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, uh, like our January presentation on the Isle of Man, feel free to let me know as well, reach out anyway. And we'll have a full list of upcoming presentations on our website at patrolley.org. I'm working on getting lots of folks scheduled right now. So hang tight. Um, there's none up there just yet, but there will be soon. And I wanna extend a very special thank you to those of you who donated when registering for tonight's program. And those of you who, had made, who have made donations through our website, we really appreciate your support. Um, tonight's program is special because um, all donations from this evening will be designated to the Shaker Heights Car 94 Fund, and I'm sure Bram will talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but before we get started, I did want to say a few words about the museum. Uh, for those who might be new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And the museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is actually located along the route of the trolley line between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. We've got about 50 trolleys and electric railway cars, about 20 of which operate, and about 30,000 visitors per year take the four mile scenic ride at the museum. And now I would like to introduce today's presenters, Bram Bailey and Rich Krisak. Bram has been a member of PTM since August of 2011 when he signed up for our Operator for an Hour program. In August of 2013, he completed his training and became a senior operator. His other interests include photography, railroad history, and model railroading. He's authored articles for most of the major model railroad and rail fan magazines, and to date he has had three books published, all on Canadian diesels. And his favorite activity at the museum is operating any PCC car. Uh, and Rich is a native Clevelander. He got his start as an intern with the Regional Transit Authority in Cleveland during university, and he has a degree in urban planning from Cleveland State University. He's a 40 plus year transit professional and his last position was Chief Operating Officer at MARTA in Atlanta. Uh, he's involved in planning, designing and operating new starts, including Buffalo, Dallas, Houston, Boston, uh, and the Atlanta streetcar. He's semi-retired and doing consulting work. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with Rich and Bram, but the chat box will be open throughout the presentation. So feel free to enter questions and comments during the show, and we can read through those at the end. And just to note, this program is being recorded and will be shared on YouTube shortly. And once more, all the donations from tonight's trolleyology program will be designated to the Shaker Heights 94 um, fund. And in fact, Bram has offered to send out a CD of high quality shaker photographs to those who donate at the $150 level. And if you're really dedicated at the $1,000 price point, we'll throw in an operator for an hour experience as well. All right, that's about all I have. Please keep your microphones muted. We'll go ahead and turn all of our videos off during the presentation so that we've got all the bandwidth available and we can easily see the slides. I will invite you to turn those back on at the end as well. All right, Bram, take it away. Well, thank you, Kristen. Let me uh, get the screen up here and running. Uh, okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, I just want to uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, just to kind of preface this, uh, this presentation um, with the fact that uh, my granddad was a Lakeshore Electric fan. And uh, as a kid, uh, there were a lot of trolley-oriented trips that went to places like Shaker Heights, Pittsburgh, Toronto, and, and every place we went, there were PCC cars. So my perception of trolley operation is PCC cars, always has been and probably always will be. 
anyway, um, I became interested in operating PCCs down at the Ohio Railway Museum and carried that over to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Uh, I was at the ORM uh, when I was a teenager, and, and then life took over, and now I'm retired, so I'm back with some time to fool around with streetcars. Anyway, uh, I want to say thanks to Rich Krisak uh, for his assistance in, in putting together this program. He's a son of a Shaker Heights operator, and his inside knowledge and images made this presentation much more complete than I could have ever, ever done alone. So uh, thanks, Rich. I'm, I'm glad to have you aboard for this. And at this point, I'm having a hard time changing slides. You might have to click on the screen first with your mouse and then hit the, hit the arrow or however you're advancing. OK, here we go. OK. Anyway, um, of course, this is going to be an unabashed plea for funding for the Shaker 94 project. And uh, this is uh, our uh, Shaker Heights rapid PCC car at the, at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Uh, this is uh, where we're at to date. We'll show you some pictures of the restoration later on. Uh, and uh, of course, the, uh, the information to, to donate is not only here on the screen, but the, uh, the roster that we sent out uh, has all that information at the bottom of the roster. So uh, without further ado, oh, I'm having a hard time seeing these slides. The, uh, I can't see the top of my slide. Anyway, uh, we're talking about Shaker Heights uh, and, and how the, uh, the Shaker Heights Rapid came to be. And uh, what happened is, is in the early part of the last century, uh, the Van Swearingen brothers uh, were developing real estate and they, uh, they purchased uh, the property in Shaker Heights with the idea of building a bedroom community for, for Cleveland. Now the Shaker uh, property was about 10 miles from downtown. Most of the people that they were, look, that, that they were building this for would have, have been working in Cleveland. Uh, so uh, they, there was a need for, for transportation. 1911, the village of Shaker Heights was fully incorporated, formally incorporated, and uh, that's when the, the vans uh, were working on, on getting their transportation into downtown Cleveland. So uh, in order to do that, the Cleveland Interurban Railroad was chartered in 1913, and that's a precursor for the Shaker Heights Railroad. It was built by a railway company, but when they were approaching the vans, they didn't want to build it. They didn't see that it was a, a viable thing to do, but the vans uh, underwrote the, uh, the uh, costs of doing that, and uh, so Cleveland Railway was all on board once uh, somebody was picking up the tab. Uh, they uh, basically built from Shaker Square on out, uh, and uh, then from there, it operated into downtown Cleveland over existing Cleveland Railway track. Cleveland Railway Company provided the cars the power and the maintenance, so it was kind of a turnkey operation. It became a Shaker Heights Rapid in 1920. It was actually purchased by the city of Shaker Heights in 1944. Now, uh, the, the drawback of the original configuration was the fact that the operation was considered way too slow. Uh, if you can imagine, here you are on private right away all the way to, to uh, Shaker Square. Now all of a sudden you're on city streets between there and, and downtown. Um, that was uh, that was the issue. And so the vans uh, envision a central terminal for uh, railways and interurbans. If you think about it, Cleveland had a wealth of interurbans coming in. There was the Lakeshore, the Southwestern, the CP and E, and probably a couple others that don't jump into my mind right now. Anyway, um, so uh, they uh, and, and, and the the vans bought a number of railroads, among which were the nickel plate. And I could get into a two hour discussion about the vans and their railway operations, but that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. So uh, what I just wanted to mention is the fact that the the purchase of the nickel plate allowed the 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 vans to have. Uh, rapid or have the right of way that they needed to get directly into downtown Cleveland to the terminal tower uh, with uh, with them to go on the surface streets. And of course, at that point, there was no terminal tower. So uh, the uh, uh, the vans in, uh, had uh, a vision for the terminal tower and voters approved 
prove that in 1919, and the tower itself was started in 1926 and, and completed in 1927. And uh, a lot of people know about the Cleveland Union Terminal. It was a big heavy electric operation. The whole reason it was there is they didn't want any of those very old steam engines pulling trains in and out of their brand new terminal tower. So uh, they uh, had a 3,000 volt electric uh, line that uh, um, had some huge, huge uh, motors uh, that they used for, for, for pulling faster trains in and out of the terminal. And as I was researching this, I learned a little bit of Terminal Tower trivia. It's 708 feet tall, tallest building in the world outside New York City until 1967. So with that all said, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the, the layout of the um, Shaker Rapids. Uh, of downtown Cleveland, and of course the Shaker Rapid comes into the, uh, the lower level of, of that. Uh, as we go further out on the, the railway, uh, Kingsbury Yards is where they used to do the maintenance work, and it was not really a, uh, a yard for, for, for keeping uh, cars in storage. It was, it was a pretty much a maintenance facility. Shaker Square uh, is one destination. They'd run some. They'd run some cars out from from Public Square or from Terminal Tower out to Shaker Square and, and short turn them. And then, of course, there was the Green Road line and the Van Aken line. The Green Road line ended at Green Road, and the uh, the uh, Van Aken line ended at Warrensville Yard. I'd like to to bring Rich in at this point. Uh, he can add some some color to, to what's going on here in terms of how the railway is is configured and operated. Sure. So, a couple comments, kind of interesting comments related to this is the the Vans eventually acquired control of Cleveland Railway back in 1930. They had it from 1930 to 1935. The reason they really wanted control of it was because they wanted to protect their investment in Terminal Tower. And they knew there were subway plans afoot and they wanted to protect their investment to make sure that they had great access into their uh, tower and their, you know, it was, it was more than a railroad station. It was really a, a huge development. Uh, so that's kind of how they wrestled control of the um, Cleveland Railway. And oddly enough, they hired Peter Witt to be a consultant to them uh, who was very much opposed to the terminal tower development and its location. So the first car operated in April 1920. It was on Moreland Boulevard, which was the name for what is Van Aken today. Van Aken was, Moreland was renamed Van Aken uh, because the uh, there was a mayor, Shaker Heights, first mayor, I believe, who was mayor for about 20 years. And in his honor, they renamed uh, Moreland to Van Aken Boulevard. Um, Green, Road, Green Road opened about a week later. Uh, it did not go all the way to the Green Road Loop. There were a couple of incremental uh, extensions of the line as it moved forward. Uh, cars were maintained, as Bram said, by Cleveland Railway, and they were maintained at a facility that was right at East 34th Street, which is where uh, the rapid actually uh, left the uh, private right of way uh, before Nickel Plate was acquired. And they ran on the streets, like Bram was saying, into Public Square. There were three different routings that they used to get into Public Square. Uh, the reason they had three different ones is they kept in trying to improve uh, runtime. Uh, like Bram was saying, that it was a very slow slogging, you know, gotten through downtown Cleveland, uh, coming up the ramp at 34th Street. And I, I read that there was a study that was done at the time that said that 40% of the overall running time for Shaker um, was on the streets of city streets of Cleveland. So it was a huge impact to get that right away from the nickel plate into Terminal Tower. And that really uh, made Shaker what it was, a, a very rapid ride into downtown Cleveland. Uh, when the city of Shaker Heights purchased the system, uh, as Brand mentioned, 1944, they spent $1.3 million, they actually went and, uh, and bonded uh, sold municipal bonds to finance it. And it's it's kind of funny when you think about 1.3 million, which you could buy today for 1.3 would be, you know, a couple of light rail vehicles. 
it's kind of amazing uh, how things have changed. But I'm also on the slide, you can see the elevation difference between uh, the terminal up to Shaker Square. And that was a pretty constant grade of one and a half to 2% the entire way. Uh, the older cars did not have a, a big problem tackling that. There were some definite issues with the PCC cars, um, more in coming down the hill in dynamic braking uh, than uh, going up the hill. So kind of, kind of interesting little dilemma when the PCCs came around. Uh, one thing that Shaker Heights is very well known for is the bi-directional rush hour they had. Uh, so you had business people going into downtown to work and you had a huge domestic crowd coming out to work in the homes, particularly along Shaker Boulevard and through the Shaker Heights uh, area. So they had the benefit of a really great, from a transit operator perspective, bi-directional rush hour uh, for most of its life. Uh, Warrensville, uh, the Van Aken line, was always the heaviest. It was the most intensely developed, uh, had the highest density of apartment buildings. Shaker Boulevard, of course, you'll see in further pictures as Bram takes you on a tour of the line, primarily uh, large single family homes. Also, I'd like to mention that uh, a little bit about the uh, the crews and the allocations of the crews. Oh yeah, you know, I you forgot about that. Yeah, so Cleveland is, is a very much uh, a divided town, uh, west siders and east siders, um, kind of like some other cities are, Chicago, I guess, is north side, south side. So the operators were a mix of, of residents of both, both the east and the west side. Uh, the union, uh, they were represented by the brother of locomotive engineers. It's the, they're the only, I think, real transit property that the B of LE uh, ever really had. Uh, and of course, the BFLE was headquartered in Cleveland. They had a, a beautiful office tower right off the square. Uh, they're still in the area. They're in Independence now. But one of the conditions of the contract was so many runs had to start on the east and so many runs had to start on the west to minimize the deadhead and travel time of the operators, which is kind of unique. So what that, what that meant then is you've got a yard at uh, Terminal Tower and you've got a yard out at Van Aken or at uh, Warrensville. And so you've basically got those two starting places where the, uh, the Van Aken cars were typically uh, the ones that were kept out at Warrensville and the green road cars were typically kept downtown and the crews uh, broken up uh, as uh, geographically as, as Rich was talking about. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about PCC cars. Um, a, uh, this, there's probably a couple of people in this presentation out here that, that don't have a full knowledge of PCC cars. So for the rest of you, it'll be a wake-up call when we're done with this. But the PCC stands for the Electric Railway President Conference Committee. It was established in 1931. Build an improved streetcar to, to win riders back because there's pesky uh, uh, Model T Fords and things like that were stealing the uh, the ridership away from the, uh, the trolleys. Members included uh, 12 large cities, over half a million. I've got them all listed there. I'm not going to read the whole list, but uh, your favorite town is, is probably there. Uh, eight cities in the quarter million to half million. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Some of those uh, cities had PCCs and some didn't. And five cities in the 100,000 to 250,000, um, of which only a couple had PCCs. Three interurban railways, uh, CNLE never had a PCC. They had those red devils, which were kind of neat, but uh, they weren't PCCs. And 26 industrial members, uh, which would be companies that either built trolley cars or built uh, sub-assemblies for trolley cars, control elements, things like that. So you've got uh, companies like J.G. Brill and Pearly Thomas and Pullman and, and St. Louis, uh, all car builders, not all built PCCs though. First PCC was built by Clark Equipment. That was their one and only PCC. Uh, it was uh, delivered in 1934 and went to Brooklyn Queens Transit. There were three phases of production. The pre-war, which typically uh, you spot a pre-war car, it's, it's got no standing windows, it's got a relatively flat windshield. Uh, 
and uh, the uh, auxiliaries are, are air operated. So you've got uh, air brakes and you've got uh, air operated doors and windshield wipers, things like that. Um, and so, uh, of course, all the PCCs had dynamic braking. The, uh, the, uh, when you talk about air brakes or electric brakes, that's what uh, brings a car to the final stop. Um, there was the uh, 1945 model, uh, which is called the post-war. Uh, that uh, typically has standy windows, although there are some that were built without them. But most of them have standy windows. Uh, uniform window posts, and they're all electric. They've got electric drum brakes. And all the accessories are electric on those. And the 1949 model, which is very similar to the, the uh, 1945 model. Uh, it just has picture windows. It's an all electric car. And uh, the last domestic PCCs were, were built by Pullman in 1951 for Boston. And uh, production was split between Pullman and St. Louis. Those were the two companies that built the, the bulk of the cars. 25% uh, went to Pullman. St. Louis got 75%. Uh, Brill came out with a thing called a Brill liner, but they got hauled to court on that. Uh, that didn't work out well. Uh, we have one in our collection. Uh, it's a nice car, uh, but they, uh, they, they infringed on a number of patents when they did that. And uh, I could talk about PCCs all day. I'm not going to do that. So uh, that's the end of the PCC lesson. Uh, and you're probably wondering, why am I starting a PCC program with a Coleman Center entrance and exit car? Well, a bulk of the Shaker Heights Rapids roster, uh, when they started off, was center entrance and exit cars uh, in the 1200 series from uh, that were originally owned by Cleveland Railway Company. And until uh, 1940, they were leased, and, and then they were purchased by Shaker Rapid. Uh, they were all in 1200 series, as I said, after they, they were purchased, they, uh, they revised the numbers, they dropped the first 12. So the car you're looking at was 1212 when it was delivered to the Shaker. Uh, this is the car that they used for fan trips. Uh, you can see they've got a, a trumpet horn on there for this particular fan trip. Uh, that's not normal. They, they had a regular uh, whistle on that thing normally. Um, Last cars in regular service were summer of 1955. Uh, they kept two five-car trains uh, in service until around 1960. Uh, these cars, uh, they could swallow a whole crowd. And so uh, for football games and stuff like that, those five-car trains were kind of handy. Um, there were other cars on the roster. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Rich again to talk a little bit about that. So these uh, these Coleman built center entrance cars were the last non Peter Wood cars built by Cleveland Railway. The first Peter Wood car uh, was in 1915, a demo car, and they liked it so much they they took off with the Peter Wood car moving forward. This was kind of an interim design. You know, most of these big city transit operators were trying to. Uh, develop all these different car designs with different door configurations and different conductors positions to to speed the boarding and lighting process. And this was kind of one of those steps along the evolution. So this had a drop center, center floor, which made the step up from the street to the car uh, much smaller. The conductor was in the center. So you paid when you entered, you moved to the right of the car, you could pay, you could move to the left of the car. Uh, as long as you pay when you passed uh, the operator. The, uh, when Cleveland Railway put them out into uh, service on streetcar lines, they found out they were really kind of a, of, of a failure. Uh, they didn't work very well. Uh, the, uh, the anticipated speed of boarding and the lighting really wasn't there. Um, the limitation of having two doors focused on the center, uh, being the only doors in the car, it was great for the motorman because they didn't have to deal with the passengers, but it really didn't quite prove out to be what they were looking for. And of course, the Peter Witt car was really the, the king of boarding and lighting, the king of car configurations really adopted all over the world. So they had a couple hundred of these cars. They relegated them to really uh, lighter uh, patronized um, streetcar lines. But however, they were perfect for Shaker because Shaker had long distance between stops, they weren't running in the streets, they weren't stopping at every you know, second and third street corner. The conductor's position was really optimal for them. Uh, and it was really kind of a perfect car. 
uh, it had uh, uh, room to put HL controls. The cabinet for the HL controls was actually in the uh, motorman's compartment up in the front of the car. Um, and uh, they, uh, they wound up uh, modifying the car so they could do 50, 55 miles an hour, which is pretty fast for a trolley car uh, in its day. Um, so they really worked out well, and they were the mainstay of Shaker operations. You know, you think of a car built in 1914, you know, still available for service in 1955, as late as 1960s, pretty amazing. But there's quite a few of these that are still in museums that are available. Um, there were several of these cars that were converted to one-man operation by Shaker Rapid in their own shops in Kingsbury. Because the uh, issue Shaker had, uh, Bram kind of alluded to this as, you know, for off-peak service, uh, the union permitted uh, one-man operation, but they didn't really have, you know, vehicles. The 1200s weren't capable of one-man operation, so they had a fleet of used cars uh, together with the three that were converted, uh, the 1200s. They were the kind of the famous uh, 300 series, which were the Fox River X or Roaring in Chicago cars, and then they had the 60 series, which were curbsiders, originally from uh, Indianapolis Southeastern went on to inner city rapid in Canton and then uh, Shaker and then eventually on to speed rail. So those were their really their, their Saturday, Sunday off peak vehicles at the PCC. So the PCCs did provide some good labor savings to them. These, uh, anyway. these cars, uh, just quickly, these cars were also tested, believe it or not, on a uh, uh, the uh, Northern Ohio, a piece of the Northern Ohio, before it went out of business, thinking that they might run a, a piece of the Northern Ohio for a commuter operation. And supposedly, although I don't know if there's factually if this actually happened or not, but on the uh, Southwestern as well, because uh, they were fast cars, uh, high capacity, and much cheaper to operate than large and urban cars. So very versatile car. So now what we're going to do is get into the uh, the, the PCCs uh, on air, and uh, that started in 1948. Uh, Shaker entered an order for 25, uh, 25 cars through uh, Pullman. Uh, they were the last cars that were produced in their Worcester, Massachusetts plant. Uh, the uh, PCCs that Shaker ordered are different than a lot. Um, they, uh, they're the wide version. PCCs could be had in four different widths from eight foot to nine foot wide. These are nine foot wide and they're, uh, they're long cars. They're, uh, they're 50 foot in length. And so uh, intention was to get as many people on there as you can. They didn't have to uh, negotiate city streets, which made for some other differences. The, there's no brake lights on these cars. Uh, Again, they're not running in traffic, so the, the lights on the markers like you'd have on a railroad, not uh, not brake lights like you'd have uh, on, a, on a city bus. Uh, they had backup controllers. They had wide wheel treads and, and deeper flanges than you would have for a city car. Um, and uh, they also uh, were set up with MU from the factory, and uh, they train-lined the, uh, the 600 volts, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Yeah, a couple, couple of comments on the, uh, the order. Um, when uh, Shaker Heights uh, purchased the line back in before and they issued bonds for the, for the purchase of the property, one of the conditions of the bondholders, who are probably a lot of folks who are, are living in Shaker Heights and riding on the system, bankers, finance people, was that they, had a, they insisted on Shaker buying uh, new cars. Now, back in 1944, that really wasn't possible because of what was going on uh, with the World War II. And uh, they had to wait till 1948 before they really were able to make a purchase. But that was, believe it or not, a condition of the bondholders. Uh, Shaker did look at other used equipment at the time they were considering the purchase of these Pullmans. They looked at, uh, believe it or not, the Pacific Electric Double Enders which were being stored in uh, downtown LA at the time. Uh, they took an option out on the Louisville PCC cars, which wound up on uh, CTS, actually Cleveland, uh, on Cleveland streets. So they took initial option. They took a pass on it because they thought the cars were too narrow. Again, like Bram was saying, 
nine foot cars. The reason Shaker wanted nine foot cars is they wanted two plus two seating. They didn't want two plus one seating. Uh, they pretty much scheduled for seated loads on the system because they were dealing with pretty high class commuters on this line. Uh, so that kind of took those cars out as a possibility. Um, St. Louis also bid on the order to build cars for uh, Shaker and they lost by $215 a car. And that's how Pullman won the order. Uh, Pullman may have had the advantage uh, to some degree uh, because of the size of the car being kind of unusual, the length in particular, uh, because Pullman had just finished up building a fleet of PCC cars for Chicago at the time. So the Shaker bodies are identical in width and length to the Pullman Chicago PCC cars. Uh, of course, they're slightly longer because of the couplers. If you measure pulling face, the pulling face of the Shaker car is actually a longer car. So some people kind of say there was an add-on order uh, to the Chicago uh, order. I'm not really sure that's true, but it probably did give Pullman a leg a really sizable uh, PCC car. Uh, in the long run, they, they did the PCCs did well in Shaker, but probably not the ideal car because Shaker was all open track running. Uh, they went with the standard B2 truck. The Shaker shops were pretty innovative and through the years they modified uh, suspension, rubber components and shock absorbers and all kinds of things to kind of settle the ride down to the point where it was uh, comfortable. And they also had to provide some additional cooling for the GE uh, equipment box because it was overheating with the extended dynamic braking coming down from the square. Uh, I've never seen a PCC car that had flag holders for uh, white flags is kind of unique, but uh, they were financed uh, with equipment trust certificates, which is kind of unusual for transit cars because Cleveland was a big railroad town. Cleveland was a big finance center. Railroads were used to uh, financing equipment uh, with trust certificates. And these cars were financed by uh, Central National Bank of Cleveland, who held the titles to the car. And also there's a couple of subsequent fleets, the Minneapolis fleet, I found out loosely was also financed through the use of equipment trust certificates. So it's kind of unusual. They were uh, a unique car in many uh, respects. As we, uh, as we uh, go to the uh, Pullman cars and see them in service, this is one out at Green Road, a little bit of, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, housekeeping here. Uh, the slides, you'll see that, that they all have the number on the left-hand corner and, and location, the date, and the photographer of the collection that came out of on the right. Uh, but the, uh, the little uh, shaker logo in the corner is a hat badge that, uh, that came from Rich Chris X collection as well. Uh, of course, the, uh, the, the Pullman cars were, were built with the left-handed sided doors. It was originally thought that uh, if they did in fact build that subway in Cleveland, that those left-hand doors had come in handy. Unfortunately, they never, never materialized. And so they built a bench seat across the, the, the doors and they were never functional in the shaker. The, uh, the next group of PCCs that came to Shaker uh, came from um, Twin Cities Rapid Transit. Uh, and there was, there was 20 cars that they bought. There's, there's kind of been two groups. Uh, the 51 through 55 were not modified for MU. They, they, uh, they just simply painted the cars in Shaker Rapid uh, livery uh, and delivered them. Uh, the, uh, the balance of those cars, uh, and we'll talk about those later, uh, were modified for NU before they got them. Uh, last cars in service were 1982, except for 54, that lasted until 1985. And this shows one of those cars in operating in Minneapolis. And here's the 55 uh, coming up to Shaker Square, uh, heading towards the terminal. So one, one interesting fact with the Minneapolis cars is when Shaker received their 25 uh, PCCs, the Pullmans. Of course, the 1200s were still in operation as well as the 300 series cars. Uh, the, three, the, the joint area has trip stops and full uh, block signals. 
Uh, so the 1200s were equipped with trip stops, as were all the PCC cars. Apparently the 300s were very difficult to equip with trip stops. I think they were, they were probably much slower than the PCCs. And so uh, apparently CTS actually paid for what I've heard up to five of these Minneapolis cars to get Shaker to um, agree to quit running the 300 series cars uh, on the line. So they actually got uh, a few of these paid for, which was kind of a nice deal. And the uh, spotting features on the, uh, the Minneapolis cars, uh, if you take a look here, there's a drip strip that goes down uh, on both sides of the cars. Now these are St. Louis built cars, so they're a little different than the uh, than the Pullmans uh, just from the general configuration. But uh, I usually look for that drip strip to figure out if it's one of the uh, one of the uh, Twin Cities cars. Now the rest of that order, there was 20 cars that they ordered, so the last 15 uh, were modified uh, at uh, Twin Cities uh, for shakers uh, or to uh, modify them for MU and, and they also painted them in shaker colors. And you see them arriving here on flat cars already painted for shaker heights rapid and they, they're uh, ready to go into service. And here um, we see the, uh, the uh, one of those cars in service. This is uh, one of the ones that set up for MU. There's the drip strip I was talking about. Uh, there, of course, there's no left-hand side door. Here's a Pullman car following it. Uh, with the left-hand side door. That's at Warrensville Loop. And then the last addition uh, were cars that came from St. Louis uh, Public Service. Uh, there was 10 cars numbered 40 to 50. And math majors out there are going to tell me, well, 40 to 50, that's 11 cars. Well, actually what happened is they were numbered 40 to 49. And uh, in 1974, they renumbered number 40 uh, to number 50, so they have continuous numbering uh, throughout the, the, uh, the fleet. So uh, it truly is only 10 cars. And uh, they uh, equipped them for uh, MU at St. Louis and painted them for Shaker, just as they, uh, just as they did the other ones. Or they did. And, and here we actually see, this is on Rich's collection, uh, car number 44 uh, hasn't left uh, hasn't left uh, Minneapolis yet. Uh, it's uh, in shaker colors and modified for MU and ready to go. It's kind of interesting at the time when you think that both Minneapolis and St. Louis still had the capability to to basically you know uh, rebuild cars, modify them for MU, MU operation. I mean, they had a, a tremendous uh, shop capability that's pretty much gone in most of the, the industry nowadays. These were the um, least like PCC cars by Shaker uh, operators and mechanics. They didn't like the blinker doors. Uh, if you look at this car, you can see that the doors uh, operate inward. Um, and the cars didn't, they, they train lined okay with the Pullman's and the Minneapolis cars, but they were kind of sluggish for some reason, even though they all had GE equipment, you could always tell if you were in a train that included a, a St. Louis car because the car was kind of sluggish and kind of bucking, um, you know, the other cars that were train line with them. Uh, so they uh, they were not the best liked cars, although they did function quite well. Uh, the cars that were most liked by the maintenance and operators uh, were the, uh, Minneapolis St. Louis cars, believe it or not. Uh, they liked them the best and they, they kept them in service the, the longest of the PCC fleet. So here we see uh, one of the uh, um, St. Louis cars uh, in service and spotting features on that, there's a, a route number sign up here. So if you're on the, uh, the right side of the car, uh, when it's coming at you, uh, you can spot that. That'll tell you it's it's one of the uh, St. Louis cars. And, and if you're on the other side, on the operator side, there's a gap in the standee windows on the on the blind side of the car. And uh, there's no drip strip there. Uh, and so uh, uh, if you see any of those spotting features, that'll tell you it's, it's one of the St. Louis. Now here, uh, this is the core fleet as it was from 1947 into the early 80s. Uh, in the, the back, you see number 44, that's a St. Louis car. Uh, in the middle is 84, one of the, the original Shaker uh, 
pulling cars. And uh, number 60 represents one of the Twin Cities cars. And that was pretty much what made up the fleet uh, up through the uh, early 80s. Then uh, later they, uh, they needed some additional cars. And uh, one of the places they went for those was Toronto. Was What was ironic was the cars that they bought from Toronto uh, were ex-Cleveland cars. So they made the full circle. Uh, they, they went to Toronto and they came back. They were built by Pullman for Cleveland. They're not wide cars. They're, they're eight foot four. They're not the narrowest cars either, but uh, uh, they were typical city cars. They were equipped for MU. I, I don't know if they ever ran in MU on the ship. Uh, Rich, maybe no. you can speak to that. No, I never they never saw ran MU. Uh, they, uh, TTC installed backup controllers uh, so they could use them in the terminal in Warrensville Yard. Uh, but they, uh, they did run MU uh, on TTC when they were uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, but not on, uh, not on Shaker. The, uh, the odd thing, like Brian was saying, is that the narrow width of these cars, when Cleveland, when CTS went out of the streetcar business, they offered this fleet to Shaker, and Shaker rejected it because of the narrow car body width and not being able to do two plus two seating. And so they basically re rejected these cars, but they wound up with them in the, in the long run, which is kind of funny. Uh, by the time uh, Shaker got these cars, was in the RTA era, these cars were really worn out because they had spent their lives uh, primarily on streets of Toronto with a lot of salt. So the car bodies were in really bad shape. They really not, did not get a lot of utility out of them uh, because the, uh, the narrow width of the car really didn't match very well with the platforms. They had a lot of tripping and falling incidents with the cars. And then the car bodies were so bad. Uh, my, my uncle Arnold Bushnell was also um, an operator for Shaker. He was running uh, one of these uh, Toronto ex Clima cars in service. And basically the body uh, let loose and fell on top of the trucks and they had to uh, tow it out of there. Uh, and I think that was pretty much the last time these cars uh, ran. They, uh, they ran on Shaker with uh, the TTC numbers, and they, they basically just pasted an RTA emblem. This was, of course, under RTA management after uh, they took over Shaker. They just pasted an RTA emblem over the TTC uh, wings, and uh, the uh, the giant sign that you see says Shaker Square, that was a short turn sign in Toronto. So uh, anyway, uh, from, from my perspective, it was really kind of cool to see the, uh, the Toronto cars there, although they, they did have their problems. Yeah, this, the interesting uh, thing, one of the in quick interesting things with these cars is uh, 4223 was the last car used on a uh, PCC fan trip in Cleveland before the cars were all uh, sent off to Toronto. And 4223 in its renumbered version, I can't remember what the Toronto number was, came back to Cleveland. So the Fancher car actually came back to Cleveland. And that's the car that is being restored by the uh, uh, Illinois Railroad Museum, the Cleveland PCC car they have. Uh, they purchased off of RTA, uh, but it turns out it was actually the Fantrip car, the last uh, PCC Fantrip in Cleveland, kind of interesting. Yeah, it is an interesting note. Uh, here we've got uh, the uh, line car, uh, 031, which was 1231 originally, became 31. Uh, Rick was talking about modifying cars for single uh, operator uh, usage. And uh, this is one of those cars. You can see the front doors in it. And of course, this is after it was, uh, it was assigned to work service. And this, uh, this car, of course, is an RTA car. It's, it's got a pantograph on it for RTA and a trolley pole on it for... Uh, for Shaker, and right now it's being used as a tow car to bring the 4652 in from the uh, N&W interchange. It uh, came in on a flat car. And then uh, the last two cars to be added to the fleet that, that Shaker owned uh, were acquired in 1978. Uh, they're originally Twin Cities cars, but they were bought by Newark Subway uh, and ran in Newark for a very long time. Uh, they managed to uh, have a wreck back in 77, where 59 and 65 uh, hit head on, I believe. And uh, the insurance from that wreck uh, is what financed these two cars. So essentially, these cars are, are pretty much the same as, as the uh, 51 through 55 series. Uh, 
their uh, Twin Cities cars, their wide cars. They uh, they uh, uh, not set up for MU, uh, and uh, they were pretty much used in the same function as the uh, 51 through 55. Uh, they operated on Shaker with the uh, Newark subway numbers, and again, they pasted the RTA over the Newark uh, insignias and uh, ran uh, the time that they were on the, the rapid. They were they were running in the uh, Newark colors. Yeah, that that uh, collision was a uh, was a head-on collision. Was the worst collision that had ever occurred on on Shaker uh, up till then, and actually since then. Uh, and it was one of those, you know, kind of comedies of errors where they were single tracking and the supervisor who was supposed to be controlling the switches was at the wrong interlocking. Uh, the radios, uh, they had switched channels for maintenance. The operator who came on uh, running one of the cars was not informed that the radios had the radio channels had been switched for radio maintenance. So he was on the wrong channel. Supervisor was in the wrong location. And that resulted in a head-on collision actually on top of a bridge. So evacuation was just uh, really, really terrible for the fire department to get people out of there. Both operators did survive though and continued uh, in service. The, uh, the final cars that, uh, that made up the fleet were, were leased. Uh, what was interesting is, is they were leased from museums. They're uh, Illinois Central's cars. Uh, the 450 here came from uh, the Ohio Railway Museum. It's kind of near and dear to me because that's the car I learned to run PCCs on. And uh, the 451 came from the Connecticut Trolley Museum. Uh, and uh, those cars were uh, were put into, they were refurbished and, and put into service on Shaker. It was a good deal for the museums. It was a good deal for Shaker. Yeah, back in the, uh, in the uh, 70s, um, there was a, uh, when RTA was created, they lowered the fare substantially down to 35 cents. And then of course you had the, an energy crisis. So you had high volume, high volume ridership. You had gasoline prices skyrocketing and they were just incredibly short of equipment, which is why they bought the Toronto cars and then bought these uh, Illinois terminal cars. These cars ro rode very well on Shaker because they had the uh, Clark B3 truck rather than the B2. And a lot of a lot of folks waited to get on these cars at rush hour because they were so comfortable. They love these things. Um, they had real difficulty getting into train line very well. Though they did train line, but I think there were some there were some issues generally with getting it to function well together. But uh, kind of a neat era for a rail fan to be around Cleveland at the time. We talked a little bit about uh, the uh, the Shaker Heights. Uh, and you, uh, what they did is you can see uh, on the uh, picture of our 94 here, uh, there's a plug right there. And that's basically uh, uh, overhead wire potential, which is wired from car to car. There's one of these plugs on the front and rear of each car. And uh, typically on Shaker, uh, the last car would, uh, would have its pole up and then every other car going forward. Uh, so in this five car train, uh, the, the last, the middle and the front car would, would have their poles up. Uh, which which uh, made it easier for the crews. Uh, the, uh, they were capable of running five car trains on Shaker, but seldom did. Uh, let Rich fill you in on that one. I'm done uh, talking about the, the four car trains. Four cars were, were typical for, for revenue service. And uh, I'm also going to turn it over to Rich to, to talk about the limitations of the four car trains. So. Yeah, so I guess that really they, they could operate in f uh, five car. They did operate well with, in five car consists. This this uh, picture here is probably of a shop train. There was a five car shop train that came out of Kingsbury Yard. These were cars that had just gone through um, the preventive maintenance inspections and they would put them together as a five car train. And they would run these with just one, with two operators, one in the first car and then one in the third car. The union permitted them to do that. Otherwise you'd had to have an operator uh, in every car. So the, uh, a lot of the Shakers platforms were uh, platforms in the sense of the word of being a platform. They, they were, a lot of them were cinder or grass. Uh, so they, uh, you know, they weren't really 
built that well for a five car train operation. And then particularly on the Green Road line, as you left Center Road and you went out towards uh, on the Shaker Boulevard line, when you left Center Road and you worked your way over to a Green Road at the terminal, a uh, power there at rush hour, even though they had a peaking substation they used to kick on at Center Road, was, was pretty bad, was pretty poor. And I remember riding with my dad, struggling to get up that grade with a four car train during rush hour. Uh, so they, uh, they were limited to a degree by uh, power at the end of the line and also platform lens. So in terms of the conductor signaling, Bram asked me a question a while back. It's a good question. How did the operator in the front car know uh, that the boarding and lighting had occurred and all the other subsequent cars and the train was ready to move? So there was a conductor signal on the dashboard of the PCC. Uh, and so the guy in the fifth car would signal the guy in the fourth, the fourth signal the third, the third to second, and eventually it got all the way up to the operator uh, in the front. So uh, kind of laborious, but it worked well and uh, it functioned well for them, but that's how the, uh, the operator in the front knew when to, uh, to move the train. Also, you might want to talk a little bit about how they passed those signals on the five car train coming up from Kingsbury. Yeah, so uh, I, rode, I rode the shop train with my dad a couple of times and uh, we were back in the third car uh, they wanted somebody, they wanted an operator in the front. They wanted somebody to be more towards the middle of the train in case something happened. Uh, and so the, you couldn't use the conductor's signal because you couldn't pass it from one car to the other. So they used the track brakes. They toggled the track brakes, uh, which, which uh, caused an alarm. Uh, whenever you hit the track brake, it caused an alarm in all the cars in the train. And then the, motor, the operator in the front would hear the track brake uh, warning signal coming on and know that it was uh, it was okay to move the train forward. Now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna take a, a ride over the Baker uh, pictorially and um, at each of the major terminals, I'm gonna put up a track plan. Uh, it would be a very interesting uh, option and uh, it's one of the reasons I put the track plans in there because I'm a model railroad at heart, uh, but it would make an interesting model railroad uh, this is uh, this is uh, Cleveland Union Terminal, and uh, you can see the blue trackage there are storage tracks, and the white track is your main line. And, and remember, this is left-hand operation because it's uh, the, the joint line with uh, with RTA or with uh, CTS Rapid. So the uh, the the trip around the loop is backwards from what you would normally. Anyway, there's a couple pictures of, of the terminal. And uh, we'll start off here in the bowels of, of the Cleveland Union Terminal, or CUT is what the, the, Shaker, the Shaker Heights Rapid people called it. This is one of the uh, non MU cars uh, waiting its turn to operate. Use those mostly on the weekends and off periods. Yep. This is and this was shot in 1957. This came out of Rich's collection. Uh, later on, there was structure built over it. And uh, you'll see in subsequent pictures, uh, it's, uh, it's very dark there. <laughs> but this is, this is, these are some of the storage tracks in the, in the terminal. Yeah, so this, that gives you an idea uh, real quick, Bram, if we go back to that. Um, it gives you some idea of the complexity of the yard along with the, uh, the good diagram that uh, Bram put together previous to this slide. Um, the yard required a lot of backup moves. You had a loop track coming right through the, the whole center of the yard. Um, when cars were added or cut from trains, they were done on the main line, eastbound main line coming in, right on the main line. Um, it was kind of like watching a ballet uh, uh, every day when I was a kid watching these guys do it because they were pulling trolley poles down, pulling MU cables out, cutting cars. Uh, and again, all while, all while they're on the main line. So it was, it was a complex yard to operate in and out of. Um, the, uh, the yard operator, uh, the guy who normally picked the yard, a couple of these guys were really artists at being able to move cars around this yard. Uh, the yard that the, uh, the switch that they're sitting on right there is the most derailed over switch in all the Shaker Heights property. And uh, the guy who was the main yard operator during rush hour, they always said, uh, they actually named the switch after him because they said he paid for it. 
by the number of days he got off for uh, derailing, splitting the switch at that location. I always thought that was kind of funny. The other thing unique to, uh, to Shaker's operation was uh, how you paid your fare and depending on which direction you were going in. If you are coming westbound, which would be coming into the terminal from, from Van Aken or from Green Road, uh, you entered the center door of the car and you paid your fare when you exited out the front door. Uh, the reason being that most patrons were coming into the terminal and there was a cashier in the terminal. So when they, when a four car train came in or two car train came in, they popped the doors open, everybody got off and they went through the cashier to pay their fare. Uh, so in the opposite direction, eastbound, you entered in the front door, you paid your fare, and then you exited in the rear door. So it's kind of a unique boarding and lighting system. It's unique to Shaker. It worked very well considering the way their, their loads were kind of balanced on the system. It was, it was kind of a unique thing uh, to watch in action. Oops. Anyway, uh, here's that same loop again. Uh, the uh, 68 has, has gone around the loop and the, uh, the uh, 85 in the foreground is, is coming around the loop. And of course, you're looking at the rear end of uh, Northern Ohio's uh, museum's uh, 1203. And uh, well, got to take a look at the fan trip here. So the uh, fan trips, when they left from the terminal, uh, were usually staged on that middle track. Uh, and so that kept them out of the way of the service cars. Uh, you see this telephone booth over here. That's the, the outbound track. And uh, so we'll go over to that, and there's that telephone booth again. It, uh, it's kind of too bad there aren't telephone booths anymore because Superman doesn't have any place to go change his clothes. Yeah. Anyway, we've got uh, we've got a couple of Pullmans here ready to leave uh, uh, Cleveland Union Terminal. They're going out to uh, to Shaker Green Road, and here we got a four car train leaving the terminal. Uh, the inbound track is the one just to the to the left of the car, so it ducks down underneath. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the left hand running area. Uh, joint trackage is what they call it. So the, the left hand there. running, I was going to say quickly, Brian. The left hand running, and you'll see later in the program, uh, was designed so that shaker cars with doors on the right side. Uh, could uh, use uh, center platforms at East 34th Street and East 55th Street. Uh, and you'll see later in the program, they switched from left to right around the Kingsbury Yard area. Uh, CTS, oddly enough, uh, um, Rapid ran left-hand from the terminal to Windermere and right-handed on the west side from the terminal eventually to the airport or West 117th Street. So kind of an unusual Unusual operation for sure. And here we got a 74 leading a uh, another eastbound um, with the terminal in the background. Here we've got one of the uh, the uh, St. Louis cars um, at the Eagle Street ramp. You can see yeah, if you the, look uh, closely at this, if you look closely at this picture, you'll see the there's cards that have been installed on the side of these. Lewis cars, and that was because there was such a spree of rock throwing uh, on the rapid at the time that there were a lot of injuries from, from windows being smashed. And so one of the um, experiments was putting these Lexan window shields uh, over the regular windows on the car, which uh, didn't look really appealing, but I guess it you know, served the function. And of course, it is Cleveland Union Terminal, and they uh, they did have a commuter train between Cleveland and Youngstown. And so, uh, anytime I get a chance to throw a picture of an E8 into a program, I'm going to jump on it. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, uh, this this guy's leaving the, the Cleveland for uh, Youngstown, and this picture has got a story to go with it. Uh, it was shot by a friend of mine, Jim Bogle. Uh, it was a fan trip. And uh, this is the joint trackage. You can see he's, uh, he's running left-handed here. And uh, he and a fellow by the name of Denny Nairns talked the uh, operator into stopping this, this car. This was not a scheduled stop. 
in order to take this night shot. So they set up the night shot, banged off about th uh, three flash bulbs, and knocked it down, got back on the car in less than two minutes. The operator said, I'll give you two minutes. Two minutes from now, I'm leaving, whether you're on the car or not. <laughs> so anyway, they, they, uh, they made it. And uh, the results were worth the effort. Now we're out at uh, Kingsbury, Kingsbury Run. Uh, this is, this is uh, not only the, uh, the uh, maintenance terminal, but it's also, uh, it's also the area where uh, they made the transition from left-hand running to right-hand running and vice versa. Uh, the uh, bridge that you see here is a footbridge. Um, I forget the story about that, but there was a reason that footbridge had to go in there. Uh, yeah, there was a there was a bridge on this property uh, when it was purchased for the shop site, and so part of the uh, agreement with the purchase of the property was that they would uh, tear that br existing bridge down and build this uh, pedestrian bridge to connect these two neighborhoods. This became uh, central to a big busing uh, school busing case in Cleveland because. The neighborhood on one side of the bridge was African American. Neighbor, neighborhood on the other side of the bridge was the uh, Slovenian Slavic village area, and they put the planks on the bridge so the kids could not go from one side to the other, claiming that the bridge was unsafe for use, and uh, uh, that formed the basis of a big busing case, which the uh, school board lost and uh, start buffing in the city of Cleveland. So this shop was built about 1930, 31. Uh, the cars prior to that maintained by Cleveland Railway at East 34th Street Station. Uh, and I read that when the shop opened up, the first thing the superintendent said was, it's too darn small. <laughs> anyway, here's another shot of the shop uh, showing a couple of differential dump cars there. The, the ox is the, the car in the background. And uh, number 12, uh, the car used as their primary fan trip car. And that's, that's the one in the foreground. And then shooting down from the uh, footbridge, uh, you can see a lot of different cars there. There's uh, the 31 we were talking about before. Uh, it was the, uh, the, the line car. They got one of the Toronto cars there. Uh, and if you look to crane the, cars in there. if you look to the 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 left side of the photo, those two those two orange PCC cars that are on the left track behind the uh, differential dump car, those were the two cars that were in the head-on collision. You can kind of see the front oh. of the one car kind yeah, of caved I see in. Yeah, one's kind of smashed in. I didn't notice that. Yeah, th those were the cars that were in the collision, and um, and they shoved them over there, I guess, until. Uh, they scrapped them and they got their insurance money paid for, I'm sure. Their Coleman car up at the top is probably number 11. Anyway, back out on the line. Uh, this is near East 79th. Uh, it's one of the uh, Twin Cities cars that came to us via uh, Newark. And we're getting further, further east. That's a Toronto car disappearing towards the bridge on the right. And uh, Pullman leading one of the uh, the uh, cities cars um, on the left, coming up on Wood Hill Road. And now we're at uh, East 116th. That's the uh, station right back in here behind that overpass. Um, and some cars heading up the hill to uh, to Shaker Square. And it's the trackage looks at like at Shaker Square. There's there's no crossover switch there. At least there wasn't back in those days. Uh, they had the uh, uh, my granddad used to call that a pear shaped loop. Um, I think uh, official term would would be a short term loop, short turn loop, uh, or a bullet anyway, loop. Yeah, you could call it that too. I guess. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, that uh, that was used for for cars that were just running from Cleveland Union Terminal out to Shaker Square and back. Uh, we used it a lot on fan trips. You'll see some pictures later on of, of fan trips used in that loop. Uh, and then in the lower corner, we've got a, a two three-car trains meeting there. And in the upper corner, that's a, a fan trip used in the, the loop. Uh, oftentimes, what we do is you go out one line, come back to Shaker Square, back the car around the loop, and then go back out the other line. 
This is just east of the, or just west of the Shaker Square station. It's literally the station's right behind you. A car train coming up led by a Bowman, number 77. And it's uh, the Shaker Square station. Uh, you know, he's loading, going eastbound. Uh, there's a little coffee shop over on the right. Uh, and uh, this is typically, you even see a Shaker Green Roads sign on these or, or Van Aken. Uh, and so then this next car is a little out of place. It's got a terminal local sign and it's in the same spot. Well, he's already, he came up, he's running that, uh, that shuttle to Shaker Square. So he's already rolled the sign before I shot the picture. And so uh, you'll see him coming around the loop here. And so now that sign is, is correct for heading downtown. So that Shaker Square coffee shop was built back in 1952. And for a rail fan, <laughs> it was a great place to sit and watch trains, particularly during the rush hour. <laughs> Excuse me. And Shaker Square is, you know, the uh, Van Aken Junction would be just past this, behind this car. And the frequency of service was so high, I pulled a schedule from 1975. And, uh, and the uh, AM rush hour, the trains coming westbound through Shaker Square, they averaged a, a car every one to three minutes in rush hour coming through Shaker Square headed to the terminal tower. So very high frequency of service. This is in 1975 when RTA had just taken over, uh, which was about believe it or not, half the ridership uh, that they had back in 1948, which was their highest year of ridership when they bought the uh, Pullman PCCs. Uh, their highest year was about seven and a half million passengers a year. And back in 75, they were down to about three and a half million or so. So this was a great place for a rail fan. You'll see a lot of pictures taken around Checker Square because the frequency of service uh, was pretty amazing during the week. It's like this is uh, another shot of Shaker Square. We're just kind of moving a little bit further east on each shot. Um, we're going to pause for a minute. And uh, when they were running the uh, 400 series cars, uh, uh, I knew some people over at Channel 5 and gave them a call and told them it might be worth sending a, a reporter out to, to, to put this on, on TV. The next thing you know, I got a microphone stuck in my face and I got my 15 minutes of fame. But uh, anyway, uh, um, it was, uh, it was they, they thought it was pretty darn interesting that museum cars were being used in everyday operation out there on Shaker Heights. So here we are as we're, we're going east again on the Green Road and heading towards Coventry. Coventry Station's right behind me. And, uh, this is uh, one of the fan trips. This came out of Rich's collection. Um, the, Fan trip at uh, Coventry. I'll show you some pictures of Coventry on the way back. That uh, it makes it kind of a unique station. This is out of Eaton. Uh, John Eagle and I, his friend of mine, taught me how to shoot night shots. We were out playing around with doing night shots this night, and, and uh, we stayed around at Eaton for quite a while. Now we're out at, at Green Road, and you can see the uh, the diagram of the Green Road uh, loop and all. And I'm going to turn it over to, to Rich to talk a little bit about the right of way you see in the background and the significance of all that. Yeah, so the, the intention of the vans was to extend the Shaker Boulevard line uh, to continue it on to Pepper Pike. And so the right of way, you can see behind these, the cars here, the right of way was graded all the way to Pepper Pike. Uh, and the poles, many of the poles were already put into place. Uh, these poles are kind of unique. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen many poles like this before in other trolley car operations. The, um, so it's kind of unique, but uh, the right of way still remains, but I think it's been encroached on. Uh, they tried to, RTA tried to encroachments on the right of way for some years, but apparently my friend Tim O'Donnell was telling me that there are definitely encroachments uh, on on the right of way, so I don't think we'll ever see an extension out to Pepper Pike. Um, but kind of unique, the um, 
The Vans had a lot of interest, which as Brand mentioned, and there were also interests in other interurban and trolley car lines. And Shaker um, had the advantage of getting a lot of equipment, <coughs> rail, rail, and uh, yeah, there are poles like this on the media line, a uh, rail and poles and all kinds of other things from streetcar lines and interurbans going out of business. <coughs> Excuse me. So those poles kind of neat look. Anyway, the uh, picture up in the upper right hand corner is 54 and the outbound uh, side of the, of the loop. My friend Bob Blatt, he taught me an awful lot about running PCC cars. Uh, and uh, he's on the inbound side here at Green Road. And this is our 94 uh, making the turn at the loop. One of the uh, Twin Cities cars, number 65, getting ready to go down. And another one of the Twin Cities cars, this one's number 61, ready to head for downtown in the snow. And here we're looking at 75. It's in the same spot as the last picture, but taken from a different angle. It snows a little bit in Cleveland. Oh, yeah. Well, you're up, you're up in the, uh, <laughs> in the snow belt there in Shaker Heights. And uh, on a much better day, we've got a 65 ready to head downtown. And this is one of the, the fan trips, again, with a 4663. This picture is, is taken at Belvoir, so we're heading back towards downtown. And uh, I can't help but think of that, that young lady in the foreground there. She's probably going to Catholic school. It looks like a Catholic school uniform she's got on. And uh, she's probably got grandkids by now. This is uh, Warrensville Road. This at one time was the end of the line. Uh, that's the reason the loop was built there. Uh, and uh, the only time I've actually seen this loop used was for, uh, for fan trips, although they, they did have some scheduled cars that came out there from time to time. You can see in this picture, this was kind of the uh, transition from the solid uh, steel tubular poles to these um, Bates poles, I guess they're called, looking at these comments. Uh, when they extended from center out to Green Road, they used these other kind of unique no, I never noticed here. that. Uh, there was, yeah, that's where they started the uh, these pole, these Bates poles. The uh, the cars just about ready to go underneath Center Road, which went over the top of the line, and underneath that bridge was a rotary converter uh, that they kicked on during uh, rush hours all the way through the 70s. Uh, this is kind of the area where the power was kind of weak from here out to, to Green Road. So there was uh, there was an old guy. Uh, and uh, from the Wayne Power Group of Shaker, and he would kick on the rotary converter and uh, sit there in a, in a old wood chair and just kind of watch the cars go by during the rush hour. And then he would take the substation offline when the rush hour was over. This is that same loop, uh, much warmer day in April, 1970. Uh, this fan trip was, was they were <clears throat> kind of all over the, the railway and we we're chasing it with the PC. So you could ride on the, Number 12, you could ride in a PCC. Uh, 11 was along for the ride. There wasn't anybody riding in that car. And, and uh, I believe the 1203 was being towed. I, I don't believe it was functional at the time. Anyway, here we're back at Eaton. This is that photo session I told you about. John Eagle and I were, were shooting some, some night shots out here. These cars are, are headed downtown. And this is uh, back to Lee Road. Uh, the, the car, the, the automobile you see on the left is what I fondly called the Green Weenie. Uh, it was a Duster 340. I had no problem catching trolley cars with that thing. Speeding tickets? Well, that was something else. <laughs> anyway, uh, speaking of cars and weird things, uh, this happened a lot on Shaker Heights because uh, the roads paralleled the, the, the trolley lines and the fan trips. There was always somebody that had a sunroof. So the dude you see 
popping his head out of the, the Volkswagen over there is officially the turret man taking movies of the uh, the train, uh, or the, the 1200s as they're pacing them. And we're, we're getting closer to Shaker Square at Southington. Uh, train of Pullman's coming in here. And here we are back at Coventry. Uh, Rich, uh, I, I understand that this car was, was unique for the anniversary. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the, the anniversary it was celebrating was the anniversary of the city of Shaker Heights becoming a, a city, not any anniversary related to Shaker Heights Rapid Transit. So they uh, they painted this car up in this gold and black scheme. A lot of people thought this scheme was very attractive. I don't think they ran it very long, maybe a year or so. I'm not sure. So maybe somebody can tell us from, from Norm or, or, or somebody else, but uh, kind of a striking scheme. And, you know, I've been trying to find really good photos, uh, clear, clean photos, because I would love to paint a model. I'm an old scale trolley guy. I would love to paint a model in this paint job, but I've yet to find anything really clear enough that I could make uh, decals off of, but kind of kind of a, a neat paint scheme. Now, uh, Coventry is kind of interesting because it, it serves as both a station, or it served as both a station on the, uh, on the Shaker Rapid and a gas station for, I believe it was Ohio. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That was the uh, the station was actually built by Sohio to um, to make up for the land lease costs of putting the the station here. And of course, part of the arrangement was to provide a waiting room for uh, Shaker Rapid uh, patrons. So it was kind of a uh, what we would call today a joint development project, although I don't think, uh, they call it anything like that back then. But kind of a unique arrangement. And the 43 is one of the uh, Samui cars, too. And then we're back to Shaker Square. Put a couple of different pictures in the same graphic, of course. But uh, what you see in the upper right-hand corner is, is number 12 on a, on a different fan trip. And uh, in this case, they had the ox pulling the 101. And you can see the very front of the 101. Uh, that, uh, that was... Uh, an ex uh, Detroit United railway car, uh, number 7763. And it was actually delivered to Shaker Rapid on its own wheels under its own power. I believe it came in on the Lakeshore Electric. And we can see in the lower picture, that's our 94 leading a two car train through Shaker Square at the loop. And uh, you can see uh, train car number uh, 0710, uh, former CTS, former Cleveland Railway. Uh, crane car that I believe is still in operation for RTA. So now what we're going to sure do is we're going to head. Go ahead, Rich. I was going to say, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's off the property now, but somebody from Norm can probably tell us. Uh, this is uh, heading back out on the Van Aken line, number 54 at Drexmore. That's the first station on the Van Aken line. If you look in the background, you'll see the uh, the green road line uh, going across the picture in the background. And uh, here's uh, a Pullman leading one of the uh, Twin Cities cars, uh, pretty much the same location. And this is the other side of Drexmore Station, um, heading out towards uh, Warrensville. Single Pullman, number 81. And a two-car Pullman train uh, at South Woodland, the next station down the line from Drexmore. And here we are at Southington. Uh, got a Pullman leading a, a Twin Cities car. And here's the uh, anniversary car again. And, and Rich, uh, would you tell the story about that, uh, that pack of newspapers there? Yeah, it's a kind of an interesting operation here. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember seeing this, and it, it, this goes way back in Shaker's history. They would load up newspapers in the terminal, and then the operators would actually kick them out of the front door onto different station platforms for the newspaper boys to get them. And uh, they would really load these cars up in the front with uh, stacks of newspaper. It was kind of a neat, I guess, another joint development opportunity uh, for the Rapid. Uh, the operators were not were not always the happiest about having to do that, but it made for a good cheap delivery for the newspaper. 
I noticed that cars uh, carrying white flags. Is there a significance? Is that run as an extra? Yeah, that must have been a special or extra of some kind. Anyway, here's our 94 again. Um, the uh, notice it's got the full skirts on it. We intend to, uh, to uh, when we rebuild it, uh, to get the skirts back to the way they ought to be. Yeah, I was telling Brian that RTA, in the RTA days, they took the uh, skirts off the cars uh, because they had a wheel train machine uh, when they extended the rapid transit uh, heavy rail out to the airport, uh, they built a new shop and that shop had a wheel touring machine in it. And it was very tough to access uh, the wheels to turn them. The skirts were kind of in the way. It was kind of a hassle. So eventually they just took them off. And also, unfortunately, during the early RTA days, they had a lot of derailments with inexperienced operators, particularly at the Van Aken Junction. That was a classic derailment spot and the skirts just kind of got in the way of re-railing the car so I always thought they looked much more elegant with the skirts on myself. Yeah I agree with that. Uh, many skirts on shaker PCCs are not good. <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, here we are at, at uh, Lee Road uh, and uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, underpass so you get a, an opportunity to shoot down on the cars there. It's uh, number 54, one of the Twin Cities 9MU cars. We got out to Linfield and we catch 451 in regular service. Um, they use these cars a lot in fan trips, but this one's actually uh, actually in service. Uh, this is out of Rich's collection as well, photographed by G.E. Lloyd. And we're, we're out at Warrensville. Uh, Warrensville had a seven track yard. Uh, nine tracks if you count the inbound and outbound side. Uh, and uh, so it was quite a quite an operation out there. Uh, there was a lot of PCCs in one place if you happen to be off in the off shower time. Anyway, make sure you got uh, 50, 54 on the outbound platform and, and the other two cars are, are in storage for the time being. I didn't even interrupt you, Rich. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say this was another compact, very difficult yard to operate out of because in order to get those cars on the stub end tracks, they had to um, go uh, westbound, cross across the street, stop. Uh, the conductor in the last car would jump on the coupler, and there was a, a handle there to hold on to, and they would ride the coupler, which I'm sure today you wouldn't do something like that. And they would watch the trolley pole going back and throw the switches to get the cars back into the right track. There were yard operators that were also out here uh, during rush hour, but the trainmen were also required to uh, get cars in and out of the yard. So it was quite a, quite an operation crossing a, a, a busy street, going backwards, uh, hanging onto the coupler of the back of a car, getting cars into the into the yard. For for many years, there was a trailer, 200 series type car trailer that was used in the yard as a trainman's room, which was kind of neat. And then eventually, uh, Shaker, I think it was, you know, it was pre-RTA days, built a new substation out here to increase, um, get them better, better power. And they built a really nice trainman's uh, room and locker room and all that uh, for the east side guys. So uh, very compact, very difficult little yard to operate out of. Here you see number uh, 52, one of the non-MU cars uh, from the Twin Cities coming in on the inbound side of the loop. And this is a good shot to show you a couple of things. This is a typical two-car train. You'll notice that the trolley is up on the rear car. The rear car is, is one of the St. Louis cars. Uh, you can see the split uh, in, or the, the difference in the uh, Standy windows there, and of course the uh, number seventy is is one of the Twin Cities cars. You can tell by the drip strip there uh, if you're not looking at a roster. But uh, anyway, this is the inbound side. This is this is where everybody would detrain as the as the as the train came in, and uh, then it would go around the loop. And in the old days, really old days, um, they used to have the weirdest situation here. It was kind of like a Y. You you bring the train yeah. in, and then they back it around. This was pre-PCC. Uh, it was like back a, it around it like and a, then you'd be on the... Yeah, it was like a U-shape. 
which was really weird. Uh, it was it was a Y, but it was actually sh shaped like a U. I can't imagine having to operate out of that. It must have been a real pain. Yeah, I wouldn't like it. That's for sure. Anyway, this is the outbound side, uh, heading back for for Cleveland Union Terminal. That's one of the Pullmans, number eighty-seven, getting ready to leave. And this is an older shot, back in 1954, shot by Dick Andrews. And uh, here you can see uh, one of the 1200s, or two of the 1200s actually in service. The 17 that you see on the right-hand side of the picture became uh, line car number 024, uh, and it still exists today. Uh, and then of course you've got the, uh, the PCCs here that looks like a couple of Twin Cities cars uh, in the picture. It's kind of amazing at this point. I mean, the, the 1200s were 40 years old at this point, which is pretty old for, for a, a railway vehicle. Or there's some that have been around longer. That's a, and it still had uh, some years of life left in it. So kind of amazing. They were venerable old cars. Um, they sure got their money's worth out of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're looking at a uh, much later date here, July 79. And you see the left side doors on, on number 74, uh, skirts are cut back. Rich was talking about that before. And even the Pullman that's behind the 74. Uh, it's uh, skirts, these cars are in storage for the time being. And, and it appears that they, uh, that they, uh, have done some body work on the on the doors are totally non-functional. There's a big old window across the whole thing. And I was asking Rich earlier about that. He doesn't know of any other cars that were modified this way. So they must have been doing an experiment of some sort. Don't know the whole it's, story on that. The other thing interesting about this, the other thing interesting about this picture is you see four different paint schemes here in the same shot. And it was kind of interesting in the uh, RTA era. Uh, Shaker had gone to the orange paint job already, gotten away from the yellow, but there was still a large fleet of cars still playing the yellow. And there were times where you would see a car train and every car would be a different paint scheme. I mean, it was really, it was really kind of funny there for a while until they, they really kind of settled into the, the, uh, their final paint scheme. There's a question in the chat about the amber light on the roof of that car. Yeah, they, those were set up so that uh, they provided gray crossing warnings. Uh, so when you uh, rang the bell, uh, that flasher would come on because Shaker had a lot of gray crossings, a lot of people turning uh, left left hand turns into in front of the cars and getting into accidents. So that was kind of a safety warning device uh, to uh, kind of enhance safety at gray crossings. I actually took this feature and incorporated it onto the, uh, the DART system on the original Dallas fleet uh, uh, where I was in charge of the rail system there. So I kind of took that f feature as well as the uh, Lakeshore style chime whistle uh, on the DART cars. Uh, original fleet of Kinky Shario cars came from Cleveland too. This is one of those fan trips we were talking about. Um, the uh, 12 is, was the regular fan trip car. And, and can you imagine today having a fan trip where you load a whole bunch of rail fans on a, on a, a what is essentially a work car, a box motor? Uh, the, uh, the Ox uh, is kind of an original or a kind of an interesting history. Uh, it was originally Northern Ohio Traction Light number 1078, and, or originally Michigan Railway 200. Then it went to Northern Ohio. Yeah traction light S1078, came to Shaker as 1078, and then got renumbered OX. Uh, but this is another one of those cars that got delivered on its own own wheels, under its own power. And uh, this is yeah. that same fan trip that I showed you before, where they were towing the 101 around. It's, yeah, it's kind of amazing, like Bram was in the uh, Shaker, and even into the early RTA days, they were pretty friendly with rail fans and doing charters. And I even have pictures of a charter where they took the uh, diff differential dump cars out and put uh, wood sledded seats in them and let folks ride up and down Shaker. I think they even took it out to West 117th on uh, 
the CTS rep and whatnot. I, I, you can't imagine something like that today with all the insurance liability. It would just be impossible to do that. But they were pretty friendly to rail fans and they were pretty open to charters. So the, I think part of that was there, there were a, a core of four or five operators like uh, Bob Blatt, Bram, Bram mentioned, uh, my dad, Anthony Krisak, uh, Don Bulch, uh, and a couple others who were, who were big rail fans. In fact, uh, there was a core of rail fans that actually saved 12 because 12 was supposed to get off the property. They were scrapping a lot of the 12 hunters. They kept three or four for work cars, like Bram has mentioned. And uh, a group of fans got together. Uh, uh, my dad was part of that and convinced the mayor of Shaker Heights, you know, could we save a 1200 uh, for charter service and convinced them to, to save the 12. And you can see here that the paint is pretty fresh uh, in this picture on car 12. And the paint was actually done by the a group of Euclid uh, rail fans out of the city of Euclid. Uh, my dad worked on this too. He did the striping, the black striping of the car and the belt rail it was part of that group that painted the car. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, the mayor was pretty happy with, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the fun people got because not only rail fans chartered 12, the chart chart 12 was chartered for birthdays, anniversaries, um, high school bands, just all kinds of things. It was really well used in charter service. And I think, uh, you know, they were pretty happy with it being out there and didn't really cause them any problems. It was fairly well maintained and ran well. One of the things you, uh, when you're out there at, at Warrensville Yard, uh, if you're shooting anything on the outbound side, you're going to get that church steeple in the background. And so uh, I wanted to, to mention it's uh, Christ Episcopal Church. As everybody asks what it is, <laughs> you can't you can't take a picture over there without seeing it. Or at least back in those days, you could. Yeah. And so here we've uh, got uh, number sixty six, one of the Twin Cities cars, leading a Pullman, uh, heading back downtown. And I believe this was on a fan trip because this is one of the ones I shot and I never had a chance to ride uh, 451 or 450 in, in regular service. The only time I rode about here was was in uh, in fan trip service. It's kind of interesting. You know, this, this car has a Cleveland sign on it. They also had, when they started repainting the cars to orange and they started putting new destination signs in, uh, they had signs uh, that said airport. And there was actually some discussion about running through service uh, from Shaker uh, on CTS and then into the airport. Of course, that never happened, uh, but PCC cars did make it to Brook Park Yard for maintenance. And what they used to do is they would couple them back to back. They would cut one car out and tow, tow with the other car and take it over to Brook Park, mostly for wheel maintenance, and then change ends and and do the opposite coming back, which was kind of a neat, uh, neat ride to go on. I imagine. And let's see, we got uh, Pullman number 87 uh, heading downtown as well. And we saw a shot a series of night shots out there. Uh, this is the inbound side, one of the Pullman's number 79. 57 sitting here waiting, uh, waiting to be called into service. And here's number and 71, looks, another one. That looks cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we abused ourselves a lot when we were young. I'm not sure I want to be doing that right now. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, he's ready to, to head downtown. And, and this, this car, uh, 87, is in the same spot, uh, ready to go downtown with 66 sitting there in storage. And here we got our 94 again, uh, ready to, to head downtown late in the day, March 1966. This was on my Christmas card this year. 93's in service, 57's uh, in storage. This goes back, <laughs> we, we couldn't figure out a date on this one. This is out of Rich's collection. But I, I suspect this is probably back in the early 60s, maybe the late 50s. But anyway. Yeah, yeah the car... The cars look pretty old there. Yeah. But anyway, that's that's 94 again, the car that's in our collection. And here we've got uh, 86 leading another Pullman at Kenmore. So we're heading we're heading towards downtown now on the on the Van Aken. 
Rich was talking before about some of the paint jobs here. you got a couple of Twin Cities cars in the orange paint job and uh, one of the Toronto cars heading down towards Lee Road. And here we are at Onaway, one of the uh, non-MU cars. And back to Drexmore. This was a, a charter Toronto car. And this is also Drexmore. So he's making the curve to come around to the uh, the green, uh, the, the main line, if you will, the, the line that goes out to Green Road. And that's the Green Road line in the foreground. You see that track in the foreground. This is uh, 53 coming around from the Van Aken line. And here we are back at Shaker Square again. Same uh, track plan. Uh, we've got the 451 being short turned. Uh, it was running the uh, the sh uh, Shaker Square shuttle. And I'm not sure what car that is on the upper right, but I like the picture, so I'll put it in there anyway. I don't have a good picture eastbound or westbound at East 116th Street, so I thought I'd throw the uh, the fan trip in there one one more time. And uh, here we are at Wood Hill. Uh, this is another fan trip. And uh, this is probably a, a good picture to show you the difference in, in the uh, in the left hand running. Uh, Rich, you want to talk through that? Yeah, this is kind of unique. So the the left hand running started here at 55th Street, and on the right side you can see people queued up waiting for a uh, CTS Rapid Transit car, and you can see the the right hand doors being used down the center platform. So you know Cleveland was unique in that it mixed. Uh, pantograph and pole operation, high floor cars and low floor cars, all on service in this joint area. And uh, kind of interesting because I had proposed in, in, in Atlanta here when I was working for MARTA uh, from one of the light rail extensions we were looking at of, of doing this kind of joint operation. And, you know, all the consultants and their brothers told me this was impossible. You couldn't do it. You know, you, you couldn't mix these kind of operations together. No one ever did this before. It was incredibly dangerous. And um, it's still running today with the Braille, Braille low floor cars and Tokyo high platform cars and, and uh, runs quite well. So here we are back at uh, Kingsbury Run. Uh, this car is actually going in the opposite direction from all the ones that we're, we're looking at before. He's uh, this is where the uh, the uh, left hand running switches to right hand running, and that's what that tunnel's all about. And it's also where the uh, CTS Rapid broke off and, and went out to, to the east end of the line. And uh, I put that in there to remind me that the next slide coming up is a fan trip that we ran out to Windermere, which is the uh, east end of the uh, CTS Rapid line. So these cars wouldn't normally be out there. And so here you are with a three car train of Pullmans at, at Windermere. And so we'll start back downtown again, uh, where Ontario Street, that's the post office you see in the background. And come on under the Lorain County Bridge, there's three nuts up on that signal bridge with cameras, can't imagine who they were. And uh, again, Lorain County Carnegie Bridge, this is a, a shot of uh, 69 and uh, one of the Twin Cities cars leaving one of the Pullmans, number 71. And we're getting closer and closer to the terminal. This is the inbound track for the terminal. Got the fan trip going in there. And so here we're looking at the, uh, the terminal trackage again. Uh, the car that you, cars that you see here in the upper picture are, uh, are on the outbound track. Uh, this is a car on the inbound track. Uh, on the inbound track, there is an office over here. This is the dispatcher's office. There was also a crew lounge in there. Uh, and they'd, uh, they'd go through that, that loop that uh, we had, uh, we showed before. Uh, here's the car coming around the loop. This happens to be number 54, one of the Twin Cities cars. It's not an MU. Uh, he's coming around the loop to, to get set up on the outbound platform. And there he is on the outbound platform ready to leave. So now we're in the, the base of the terminal tower. Let's go up to the, uh, to the uh, viewing level here. Uh, and we're looking down at some of the storage yard. You can see one of the PCCs there. Uh, and if that's looking west. And if we look east, 
what you're going to see here, here's here's one of the PCC cars. Remember, they're, they're left-hand running, so he's going in this direction here. And there's some uh, uh, CTS airporters heading outbound. And, oh, heck, everybody loves boats. So uh, we'll just take another look at that. This is collision band. And uh, there's a lot going on in this picture. Uh, you got an oar boat going uh, up the river and a sand sucker there in the foreground, a tugboat working on that thing. And uh, fortunately for me, I've got a friend who's a boat nut. Uh, his name's Dave Lawler. And uh, so we turned this into a cheat sheet. The, uh, the boat on the uh, left here is the Canadiana. It's a passenger vessel that was being stored in Cleveland for a long time. It wound up in Buffalo. They were going to make a, a casino out of it, I guess. That never happened. Uh, this is the Eagle Street ramp. The uh, ore boat is Wilson Marine Transit's Ben Morrell. It's a conventional ore boat with, with cabins at both ends. Great Lakes Towing Tug, we couldn't identify it uh, specifically. And uh, National Sand and Material Company Limited, that's a, a Canadian operation. It's a sand sucker called the Charles Dick, and I won't make any jokes about that. The uh, Eagle Street uh, lift bridge uh, is still there, but it's in that position. It stays up. And uh, this is the Cleveland Fire Department where their uh, fire boats are located. Jim's Steakhouse used to be a great place for, for a steak. You could watch a lot of interesting activity on the river. Yeah, and then there's the, there's the old Erie Freight House. So this part of the river was called Collision Bend for obvious reasons. If you can take a look at how tightly you had to turn, you know, to go up river to where, so this boat's going up river to where the steel mills are. Uh, it's obviously carrying ore pellets uh, for steel making. And uh, this is one of the shorter ore boats because the newer ore boats are much longer than, than the Ben Morrell here. Um, it was really amazing watching these guys get around this bend with these huge ore boats. And uh, I shot a few pictures uh, in November this year to, to show you what the area looks like today. And uh, the upper right hand picture is Green Road. Uh, the loop is sort of there, uh, about three quarters of the loops there is a big chunk of track that's missing. So it's not functional. Uh, and then uh, Shaker Square, that's, they fancied that up a lot. Uh, the, uh, there's, there's still a cafe over here. Didn't get into it when I was there, so I don't know what it was like inside. But it used to be nine tracks across here at uh, Warrensville, and now it's only three. So uh, they're certainly not uh, storing a whole lot of equipment out there like they used to. I'd like to uh, thank all the photographers. I've listed them all out here uh, that, uh, that uh, whose material I used for this program. And uh, the bibliography kind of speaks for itself. Um, and uh, special thanks to Rich. Uh, his, his knowledge just... Uh, uh, makes this uh, makes this a much better program than it would have ever been with just me putting it together. So anyway, uh, we're uh, leaving town with uh, leaving Cleveland with number ninety four on the head end of a, a three car train, and I'm uh, making an unabashed plea for funding for the Shaker project. I thought maybe it'd be a good idea the Shaker ninety four project. I thought it'd be a good idea to show you what we're doing. Um, Pictures on the left are the car pretty much the way we got it. And the ones on the right are what we've done to date. We've, uh, we've restored it to the, uh, the three-stripe, the original uh, three-stripe paint scheme. Um, we intend to uh, make the, uh, the uh, left-hand doors operational. And I thank Ned for uh, supplying the pictures here. And of course, there's still a lot to do. Um, window renovations, uh, we've got, uh, they've got all Lexan windows in them and, and they let some light in that you can't see very well through them. Uh, so we wanna replace those with safety glass, new gaskets, and, and we need to repair and polish the windshields. Door renovations, doors, uh, uh, they need a lot of, of work. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the specifics. There's seating renovations. Body restoration, we've done a lot, but we still have a lot to do. We want to restore those fender skirts. Um, there's some floor, uh, floor repairs that are needed. Uh, we need to replace the boards and the, and the roof where the trolley base is. And uh, we have a set of trucks that we uh, 
are going to use under here. Um, and uh, right now I've just got it sitting on a pair of our trucks for the time being because we're a, we're a wide gauge museum. We're five foot two and a half. Uh, we look at the Pennsylvania Railway at four foot eight and a half as a quaint narrow gauge railway. Uh, but anyway, um, we uh, we need to uh, we need to uh, inspect the uh, motor generator. It's probably going to have to be rebuilt. Uh, a lot of rewiring in there. It's a 1948 model. Uh, a lot happens to wiring over the years, and it's it's not good. And so there's a lot of work we need to do. So we would appreciate uh, whatever you uh, feel like donating and we'll, uh, we'll uh, be very thankful for you for doing that. So uh, anyway, all the donation information's there. It's also on your, uh, on your uh, rosters that we handed out. Uh, anybody that uh, wants to uh, donate 150 or more, we're happy to send you a CD of high resolution Prints or high resolution photos. There's about 107 on there, I think. And uh, there's also a few low resolution, about a dozen low resolution pictures on there. They aren't bad, but they're not, I wouldn't call them high res. Uh, anybody that wants to donate over $1,000, uh, we'll put you into the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's Operator for an Hour program. I want to warn you about that. Chances are real good you might wind up uh, as a uh, Pennsylvania Trolley Museum operator. It's happened to a bunch of us. I'm one that fell for it. <laughs> not, the, not the least bit sorry about it either. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. People, people ask you what it's like to run a trolley car. And I tell them that, well, it's about as much fun as you can have with your clothes on. Anyway, that's about all I've got to say. We can open it up for questions unless Rich has got something he wants to say before we do that. No, uh, on, only thing I'd like to say is uh... You know, most of uh, well, first of all, I really enjoy working with Brian putting these together. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, same here. And the uh, most of the stuff in my collection, uh, believe it or not, came back came off of eBay, uh, where uh, there were uh, photographers that were noted. You know, I tried to credit them, but you know, most of the stuff you buy off of eBay, yeah, you know, there's no there's no photographer that's noted on there. So if we missed you. Thank you very much for taking those pictures because it, it really provides a wonderful history of this time period. Wonderful. Um, Bram, if you could leave this slide up for just a moment. Um, I want to sure. thank both uh, you and Rich. And if you have any questions for our presenters, I will let everybody unmute in just a moment. But before I do, um, I do want to uh, announce that we do have a program scheduled for April 20th now, um, Steve Barry will be doing Philadelphia Commuter Rails, a 40-year retrospective. So we'll head back to Philly in April, and we'll have some others coming up before then as well. So stay tuned to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum website for um, announcements of upcoming programs. And if you didn't get the roster that Bram was talking about, um, if you look in the chat a few minutes ago, I did share a link to the PDF. It is on our website. So feel free to click on that and download it. And you can also visit patrolley.org slash support to make any donations. And on the donation form, you can actually designate your fund to um, Shaker Heights Car 94 Fund. Um, so thank you guys again uh, for joining us. Let me make it so everyone can unmute themselves and feel free to turn your videos on now as well. Uh, let's see. Allow participants to unmute themselves. All right, so if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat. There's lots of nice comments coming in. And thank you again to those who have donated. We truly appreciate it. Um, if you're having trouble turning your video on, it might be because I turned it off at the start of the presentation. So just uh, let me know in the chat if you'd like to turn it on. All right, any questions for Bram and Rich? Will they need to replace the uh, 1980 cars? Yeah, they um, they did send a number of the Breda cars off to get rebuilt, but that was not the most successful rebuilding program. The Breda, Breda cars have serious corrosion issues. Uh, so they were intended to be replaced first, followed by the Tokyo U cars, which also have incredible corrosion issues around the bolster area. So what um, they did put a, 
an RFP out. Uh, they made a first effort that apparently uh, didn't work too well. They're going back out again a second time. But they're finally going to resolve this issue with high level, low level boarding on these two systems. There, there have been a couple of attempts in the past to go with a universal car that could be used both on light rail and the heavy rail. In fact, the center door of the Breda cars, you can pretty much use on a high platform uh, area by putting a trap over the, the door. Um, so the idea now finally is to go for a universal fleet of cars that could operate both low platform and um, high platform. So we'll see how that progresses. We did get a question in the chat um, at rush hour, how many PCCs were needed? you know, fairly close to, they didn't have a big spare ratio. So they probably put 50 cars or so out there, I, I would imagine. We're getting some other questions in the chat too. Uh, sorry, my internet is going in and out here. So sorry if I drop out. Uh, how was snow removal han handled during winter ops? Well, there are a couple different ways. They, they used the ox for a while. Uh, and then the ox was eventually converted when they got rid of 101 which actually went to Ohio Railway Museum. Um, and they, they converted the ox to a line car. Um, I think around that time is when they took the plow off the ox. And then they took a crane car, one of the uh, old Cleveland Railway, because they actually went with my dad a number of times. The crane car, as you can imagine, because it had a crane on it, like you guys have on PTM, is a heavy frigging car. And so they would take the crank car out, load it with a lot of scrap rail on top of it to get even more weight on top of it, put a plow on it. And that's what I used to go um, to work with my dad plowing uh, on Shaker. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Now they have a, you know, a new RTA bought a new, you know, snow plow. I see uh, Richard Allman, you have your hand up. Did you have a question? Well, just it was a great program, Rich and Bram. Uh, Rich, I wanted to greet you particularly because we've been back and forth about yeah. our, our current project. I finally get to see you in person. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, let's see. There was another question from one of our volunteers, Ray Janosko. Did all the cars have backup controllers? Yes. Yeah, they couldn't operate in the terminal or, or Warrensville without them. Excellent. Uh, Hugh, I see you have a hand up as well. Uh, you are currently muted. I clicked ask to unmute here. There we go. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Bram and Rich for an excellent presentation. It was just wonderful photographs. And also, if I might add, uh, Rich, I briefly worked with you at Dallas Start from 1990 to 1992. And uh, I'm happy to meet you again some 30 odd years later. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like yesterday, but it wasn't. <laughs> if you recall, yeah. I worked for Rick Brown uh, doing, the, doing track design. Yeah, he's long retired now, I guess, out in uh, Phoenix. Yeah. Where are you now, Rich? I'm in Atlanta. My, uh, my last full-time position was with uh, MARTA as the chief operating officer. Well, so I, I left about three years ago, three and a half years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It's a small world. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, so we did get another question in the chat uh, from one of our volunteers. Michael, what were the reasonings behind the reduction of stripes in the paint schemes over time? You know, they went through so many. They had the three stripe scheme, the one stripe scheme, the two stripe scheme. Um, kind of crazy. Some cars were delivered with single stripes. Uh, the Pullmans eventually went to single the double, you know, they were just always, I mean, not full, they were always fooling around with paint jobs. Uh, the big shock was when they went to the orange. That was um, uh, fairly, fairly disliked by the operating yeah, okay. staff and made his people. Yep. Yeah. Well, that, uh, 
original paint scheme was copied from Cincinnati too, and I don't think they were shy about uh, yeah, about that's right. disclosing that. I just so Paul Paul Jones was the uh, when Shaker bought the system. Uh, back in 44, Paul Jones kind of came along with the system and he was like the Department of Transportation superintendent or director, I guess. And uh, he visited Cincinnati uh, when they were searching around for rolling stock. Uh, in fact, he was the guy that went out to Los Angeles to look at the PE double enders and Louisville. Oh, and, uh, drives me up a wall. and he was really impressed with... Um, the Cincinnati paint job. I think he liked the high visibility because Shaker had a lot of gray crossings and it was just a very attractive paint job. So that's uh, how the cars came delivered. What are the headways now? I have a uh, series of timetables and over the years it became uh, greater and greater headways until I think it was 20, the last timetable I have, I think was 24 minutes on each branch. None right yeah, here. It's probably 15, 20, something like that. The, the ridership drop um, on Shaker is amazing. I mean, it's just uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, it's pretty dismal at this point. What was the reason for Harry Christensen to uh, propose converting it to a busway? He hated the uh, rail well, for some reason. I, uh, I you know, Harry would say we... Last time I, when I did my presentation uh, on the Cleveland in the fifties, that question came up as well. You know, Harry was my, Harry was a friend of my dad's. He was a friend of a lot of the rail fans. I mean, he was a rail fan. He wrote, you know, three or four books, you know, but for some reason he just became, he really got into the uh, Albert Porter anti-rail camp, you know, freeways and buses and, and uh, I never really understood, you know, why a guy who loved it so much, you know, kind of are going down that path. So, uh, I mean, there's been recent discussion about uh, converting Shaker into a, a, a busway, but I think only up to Shaker Square and then getting rid of the rest of it. I don't think that's going to be possible politically because I think uh, even though its ridership is fairly low, I'm not sure that the citizens of Shaker Heights would be really amenable to that. But, but I mean, who knows? Uh, the ridership is very light now. I think they only put maybe 10 or 15 cars in service, you know, of the Bredas on a daily basis. Uh, so um, I, I was encouraged to see that in the fleet of cars that they could use both on Shaker and on heavy rail, because for a while there, I was really fearing that, that uh, Shaker might be scrapped and abandoned. Uh, Rich, um, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I was just going to mention really quick that uh, Rich did reference uh, a presentation that he gave for us about a year ago, which you can see on our Pennsylvania Trolley Museum YouTube. And Bram has given presentations with us before as part of our virtual West Penn Trolley Meet. It was a presentation on Toronto PCC, so uh, he's definitely a PCC aficionado. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll see uh, both of you guys and a lot of our viewers here at the West Penn Trolley Meet in person this year on June 3rd and 4th. And we'll be uh, releasing more information about that shortly. Okay, sorry, Paul, to interrupt. I already sorry. signed up to operate for that one. Oh, cool. Good. Uh, Rich and Bram, fantastic uh, presentation. One one question, kind of more modern RTA times, the the... The river line or the, the extension, the lakefront line, excuse me, the extension, I, I, I've heard that it closed a while ago because of some either bridge issues or something. Any Anybody have any updates on, is there any timeline to reopen or? It was kind of seasonal there for a while, wasn't it, Bram? I don't think they operated in the winter time. Well, I, I haven't paid attention, to be honest with you. I kind of lost interest when they got rid of the PCCs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of, you know, when... Uh, when RTA took over, uh, it kind of shaker rolled upside down for me because I shaker was always, uh, I mean, it was a small operation. It was kind of a family thing. You know, the, uh, they were, um, sons and fathers who worked there both in the maintenance side and, and the operating side. Uh, and it was really a, a very, it was a nice place to work. You know, uh, the operators I think were fairly well taken care of by the city. Uh, 
you know, and they uh, they struggled along for a long time, uh, surviving out of the fare box, you know, with uh, decent ridership. And when RTA took over, it kind of turned the world upside down. And then when the PCCs got, you know, when the Bredas replaced the PCCs, I guess for guys like Bram and I, it just wasn't quite the same attraction uh, as it used to be. It was it was a whole different era, for sure. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun growing up, being being able to have access to Shaker as a kid, and because I had so many relatives who worked for the system, I could, you know, as long as I was with a relative, whether it was in the shop or uh, with the maintenance away guys doing whatever, uh, as long as somebody was watching, I pretty much go where I wanted to in the system, which was really great for a kid who was a rail fan to grow up to have that kind of access, you know, to a system. I do remember during our practice session, uh, you had said that you weren't allowed to go on one of the fan trips, right? Yeah, the picture Bram showed at, at Warrensville of the of the PCC and then the uh, and then the ox behind it. I would I desperately wanted to go on that fan trip, but my mother wouldn't let my dad take me because she was scared to death that I would fall out of the ox and just kill myself, you know, on the right away. <laughs> so I wasn't permitted to go on that one. So I was very, I was really upset at her for many years. <laughs> uh, we had a question from Matt Non in the chat. Um, when Shaker purchased the X SLPS PCCs, were they modified from that two pedal configuration to the typical three pedal configuration? Yeah, they were, you know, they, they also had the, that strange kind of sun visor that went way up in front of the operator's face. And yeah, that was kind of the um, St. Louis PCC cars were kind of unique PCCs in many ways. It, it's, uh, it's kind of incredible to me that both, uh, you know, Minneapolis was known for its shop. They had the Cold Spring shop. Uh, St. Louis was, was well known and they still are, or they have, were even with the bus system until recently very well known for running and, and running a great bus maintenance facility. But it's kind of amazing that those shops had the abilities back then to totally rebuild a PCC, convert it to multiple unit operation, different pedal operation, all that stuff in their shop. I mean, it's pretty incredible. They and it was great for Shaker. Before they got them too. Yeah, and it was great for Shaker because it was like one-stop shopping. They, they did the whole thing for them. They rebuilt them, put backup controllers in, put MU in, did the whole thing for them. Uh, all negotiated in the purchase price, which was, a, which was a great deal. But one funny thing on the, um, when the Cleveland cars came back from Toronto to Cleveland, one funny uh, uh, story about that is they paid more for them to bring them back in the RTA days in 78 than they sold them for to Toronto in the 50s. It's kind of an amazing, <laughs> kind of an amazing story. One of the books I read said that uh, Detroit wanted to get rid of the PCCs to Mexico City so badly that when the Mexicans demanded repairs, repaint and so forth, they did it. And it cost them more for the repairs. Than yeah, that's that. a funny story. You know, I, I read that same story and apparently they, um, the uh, Mexico City made an initial offer to them uh, for a higher price. And then when they came back to them a second time around, they were pretty wised up about it. And they said, okay, well, in that case, you got to do all this rebuilding of these cars before we get them. And, and they wound up, you know, getting a much better deal than they did with the first offer. So that's kind of, that's kind of funny how things go. And the interesting thing was that Detroit uh, politicians wrote, according to this book that I read, that uh, the loss on the PCCs was well worth it to get them off the street so that the cars could run freely. Yeah, yeah it's kind of it's kind of crazy, you know, because Detroit had a couple of lines like Woodward Avenue, where those cars really, you know, they strutted their stuff on Woodward. It was a, it was a center. A lot of it was center of a center reservation right away, so they had their own right away. And I never wrote it, but I remember my dad talking about when he went to photograph ran these cars uh, in Detroit. It was kind of like riding on Shaker. So they were doing, you know, 48, 50 miles an hour down the middle of uh, Woodward Avenue, these things. Well, General, General Motors said, uh, you don't need these, just 5105s and freeways. Yep. All right, uh, 
any other questions or <clears throat> comments about Bram and a Rich's presentation? All right. Thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, it was a lot of fun. It was fun. And uh, Rich, did you, sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, we're hoping that Rich will come back and present another presentation for us sometime this spring. Uh, did you want to mention yeah, I that at all? Yeah, I definitely will. Okay. Yeah, I definitely will. So that that one's going to be kind of interesting because there's uh, this kind of a connection to this presentation and also to the uh, the one I did on Cleveland Inch Transition in the 50s because it focuses on the, the fan trip uh, PCC 4223, a Pullman CTS PCC car on its last fan trip in, uh, in Cleveland before it was sold to, uh, to Toronto. So it kind of talks about that. It's kind of, it was kind of neat. Um, the PCCs being the, the newest cars in Cleveland were actually the first ones to go because they were marketable. You know, there was a big market for these PCCs. So the Cleveland system wound up uh, ending with uh, old 1929 Peter Witts in service uh, in the 50s. So hopefully that'll be interesting to folks. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you guys again so much for putting this together and uh, working together. I thought it was uh, a really interesting presentation and it will be available on the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum YouTube within the next couple of weeks. And thank you again to everyone who donated tonight. Um, as you can see, uh, Bram and Rich are very passionate um, about the system and uh, any, anything with, that we can do to help the uh, Shaker Heights Car 94 Fund uh, is worth it. And uh, I hope that you all can join us again sometime soon. We'll get a schedule going and put it up on our website. Uh, on the main page of our website, you can see the Trolleyology banner. Just click that and you'll get a list of upcoming programs once we have them scheduled. So thank you guys again. Hope to see you again soon. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.